Well, morning folks, welcome to Iced Tea with Job. Uh, apologies for the dark glasses again, it's just, it's a very bright day and um, I'm recording this the night before and I really don't want to just be squinting all the time. Thank you for those, to those of you who've been in touch and you're finding Job really helpful and, and many of you are going through pain and suffering in different ways. And that's why this book it really is so helpful because it's not trite and it's not trivial, but it's not hopeless. And I think it helps us see Christ coming to the pit, into the pit with us. So let's just come on to Job's uh, last few words. Oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense. This is chapter 31, verse 35, if you've got a Bible. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Surely I would wear it on my shoulder. I would put it on like a crown. I would give him an account of my every step. I would present it to him as to a ruler. If my land cries out against me and all its furrows are wet with tears, if I have devoured its yield without payment or broken the spirit of its tenants, then let briars come up instead of wheat and stinkweed instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. It does seem kind of strange, doesn't it? that Job ends with talking about his land and, and what he's done about it. Um, I think that that, yeah, I, that a, that's, a, that, that's a fascinating thing for me. It, it is, much of this Job, m much of this book is not the way that we would expect something to be written. And that's why we, we're better sticking with this, but I think this is really interesting. Now, by the way, yesterday, I think I ran out of time, uh, Job talks about concealing his sin in his heart because he so feared the crowd and dreaded the contempt of the clans that he kept silent and would not go outside. And that is a real temptation. There's a real temptation to go along with the crowd, to go along with the particular group that we are in, not to speak. And I, I find that in the church. I, I, I find it a bit depressing, to be honest. Uh, I find it in the culture. Of course, there are people who are just cantankerous and moan and, and all the rest of it. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about daring to speak up for what is right in the context where you, you're going to receive the crowd and the mob is going to go against you. Well, let's come back to this property. So the land weeps because of injustice. That's what he's saying. And I think there are several things here. Firstly, the importance of land and private property. I have a theory that I'm working on at the moment. I think that the 19th century kind of Russian revolutionaries, the kind of people that Dostoevsky and, and, and Tolstoy and so on were writing against, and you kind of liberal progressives today, what, are they, what they were trying to get rid of is marriage, church, and private property. And I think in our culture today, private property is under severe danger. We, we don't own things, we rent them in the sense of, you know, online or records or anything like, you know, things like that. Now, it's a bit more complex than all of that. But I am a little bit concerned that if everything is owned by the government or a few corporations, that that severely diminishes human rights and freedoms. Anyway, here, land, he's saying, it was wrong of him as a landowner to eat the produce without payment and to misappropriate the land. And to me, this is about Christianity at work as well as at worship and at home. God's law touches the whole of our lives. And then verses 35 to 37, this really is Job signing off. Now, Job recognizes, let me just summarize his defense. I think he does recognize that sin must be dealt with that the heart and mind must be guarded, that the eye is a gate through which all kind of evil enters, and that the secret of holiness lies in the mind. Each one is tempted, says James, James 1, 14 and 15, when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed, then after desire is conceived it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. So, in a practical sense, we we have to take steps and Psalm 119 says, turn my eyes away from worthless things. We basically live in God's presence, coram Deo, in the presence of God. 
I think this is great faith by Job to challenge God in this way. He's aware that although his sins are against others, it is God whom he ultimately sins against. He's aware of God's omniscience, judgment, creative power, majesty, and existence. This is his defense. And I wonder what yours would be, what mine is. Oh, that I had someone to hear me, he said. Well, Job does, and so do you, and so do I. But oh, that I had someone to defend me. Well, let me ask you this. If you're not a believer, how are you going to answer God on the day of judgment? And if you are a believer and you look at your life just now, do you hang your head in shame? Do you weep, Lord, I have let you down? Do you come seeking God's forgiveness, knowing that your only defense is Jesus? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It doesn't mean that we don't care about sin. It means that we care about them all the more because they matter to Christ. And so there's a sense in which we go and we say, right, here we are, new year. I've let you down, Lord. I bless you for your forgiveness. Now I, I endeavor after new obedience and seek to serve you with all the power that you enable me to and, and with all the love that you've given to me. Help me to use it for your glory. All right, uh, we shall see you tomorrow. By the way, because the sun is so bright here just now, I haven't been able to see the time on the clock, so who knows how long this has taken, but I hope it's helpful to you. It's certainly very, extremely helpful to me. We'll return again tomorrow. God bless you. Bye.